Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we are going through the entire book of Revelation. As you can see by the title down there, we're at Revelation chapter 15. We're starting uh, 15. We're going to be starting on verse 1. And if this is where you are too, you're more than welcome to read along with us, or you can always go back and start from the beginning. Uh, we're taking Revelation small, in bite-sized chunks, easy to digest and understand. We're doing a couple of minutes here and there, you know, none of our videos are, are too long. And so I hope that this has been a help for you. And uh, I certainly hope this has also been uh, eye-opening and perhaps even a blessing for you. We're gonna start at verse one. Remember, this is John's vision, right? This is John's vision, John's revelation of the end times. He says, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. That's an interesting phrase, the wrath of God, because it doesn't come up a lot in scripture. We don't think about God as being wrathful and vengeful. We typically think of God as being loving and forgiving. Does God love us? Absolutely, God loves us. Is God patient with us? Yes, absolutely, he is patient with us. But have you ever lost your temper with your kids? You know, you're, you love them, you're patient with them, and, and you're patient, and you're patient, but then something happens and it just kind of pushes you and, and you lose your temper. Is that what's happening here? No, not really. Uh, we do have a loving God and he is patient with us, but we also have to recognize that he is also a holy God. So for as much as God loves us, he also hates sin. And we are living in a time where that hatred of sin uh, is being held back. God is holding his wrath back. He is holding that judgment back. And so there is a moment in the future where, as it says here at the top, that, you know, this is, this is it, this is the last, where God's wrath will no longer be held back, that will be unleashed against all those who are his enemies. Verse 2 says, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. All right, so what's... What, was, what is all this? Well, from reading Revelation, you, you should already uh, be putting those images together in your mind. Uh, when we first saw John writing about the throne room, right, he described it, the sea of glass in the throne room. So this is where we are. And John says, standing uh, at the edge of that are, are a group of people who didn't sway, right? They didn't sway. They didn't give in to the one world government. They didn't give in to the one world currency. They didn't take the mark of the beast to buy and sell and trade. And it says, the, you know, the number of its name we saw back in uh, Revelation 13, that number is 666. So that was something to do with the mark of the beast. And so here we see these people now standing victorious in heaven. You know, uh, more than likely, these people will have been persecuted on earth, perhaps even executed, put to death for their beliefs, put to death because they refused to take the mark. And from an earthly perspective, it might appear as though they lost. People who watch them die will think to themselves, that'll never be me. You know, I'll, I'll gladly take the mark. That won't be me. And, and how sad for those people and how, how sorry I feel for those people. But Revelation says those people are the ones who win. They are the ones who are victorious. They are standing beside the sea and they have harps in their hands. And we know that those who are left, those who are the enemies of God, well, they will receive God's wrath. So it's, you know, what, what do you think's better? Being in heaven with a harp and being crowned victorious or having to stay on earth and uh, accepting the mark of the beast, falling in line with the one world government, falling in line with the, with the beast and his false prophet and receiving the wrath of God. Well, these people in heaven with their harps, verse 3 says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. 
So again, what would, what would that be? Well, we think about Moses, we think about the Exodus. God uh, chose Moses to lead the people out of Egypt, right? And he led them through trials, led them through desert, through hunger, uh, through the Red Sea. The Red Sea parted, and then the enemies of God, the Egyptians, chased after the people. And when the sea closes up over the Egyptians, Moses' sister sings a song, and she talks about how victorious God is, how victorious the people are because they follow God, and that God poured his wrath out on his enemies, namely the Egyptians. Miriam's song says that horse and rider were thrown into the sea, and certainly we're seeing that again now here at the end times. God hates sin, and I think as believers, we should also you know, we, we tolerate sin, I think, as believers, and we put up with it, and we think that God puts up with it. You know, we think, oh, well, I'm forgiven, so God doesn't care. God turns a blind eye to my sin. You know, God, God allows me this little, you know, this little transgression. But 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5 says, For you are children of light, children of the day, and we are not of the night or of darkness. See, the world might tell you that you belong to the world, but you don't. You belong to God. And because God is holy, he asks us to also be holy, to walk in the light as he is in the light. God set us apart. Back in the Old Testament, the Jews were called a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. That is our heritage. So we cannot follow after the things of this world or tie ourselves to them. One day, all of it will burn. All of it will receive God's wrath. And we have to pursue holiness. That's what we should be doing down here, pursuing holiness, allowing God's Spirit to sanctify us so that we can win against our struggles with sin. We should hate sin because God hates sin. We should hate sin because it separates us from God. We should hate sin because it dulls our senses. It convinces us that what we hear and what we see and what we're doing is right because everybody else is doing it. But that's, that's wrong. Sin binds us. The Bible tells us that, that sin locks you up, that sin sets, puts you in jail, you know, and it, it keeps you apart from God, which is why God sent his son, so that we can be set free from sin. So we we should be trying to continue to run as far away from sin as possible, to continue to be free people, to live as children of light. We should hate sin because God hates sin. I'll close with 1 Thessalonians 5 and then read uh, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.